Welcome back to Curious Conversations. Today, our special guest is Dr. John Adler, the CEO and Editor-in-Chief of Curious. Hi, Dr. Adler. How are you doing today? Hello, Shreya. Good morning. Yeah, so Dr. Adler, today we're going to be talking about a blog post that you did on credible science, as well as an awesome article that you published during the COVID-19 pandemic on neurological radio surgery. So Dr. Adler, before we jump into that, could you tell me a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. Uh, I am a, a neurosurgeon at Stanford, a professor of neurosurgery at Stanford, and I've been uh, mostly focused on treating brain tumors in my career. But within that field, I'm a, what's called a specialist in stereotactic radio surgery. And in the context of doing uh, treating patients with stereotactic radio surgery, I've also developed some equipment in the field. So I'm, I'm noted for the machines that I've made in this field, as well as treating patients in this field. Awesome. Well, that leads me right to my first question, actually. Um, you're one of the leading pioneers in radio surgery currently. So what drew you to this field initially? I felt the benefits for patients were just so amazing. And uh, I felt it's very much the future of medicine. Uh, the idea that you could remove a tumor painlessly on an outpatient basis and for relatively little cost and virtually successful all the time uh, that is really one of the great miracles of modern medicine, but it is uh, it has gone on quietly. This revolution has happened quietly in the last thirty or forty years, and uh, and that frustrates me. So I think that we we underutilize radio surgery by a factor of ten or more, and so much of my life has been driven by trying to make this technology much more widely available for patients. Wow, that's a great mission. So let's go ahead and actually jump into your blog post first. Um, you published a new blog post for Curious in which you detail the differences between important science and credible science. Could you walk through what each of these mean? Um, sure. So important science is defined by the common media vernacular. It's, it's the, the idea that some scientific thought or concept may have widespread application to the society or the people. And I think the news media, for its own good reasons, you know, they want to get clicks and they want to be seen. They focus on the type of issues and concerns that affect lots and lots of patients. Uh, and that's arguably what why we'd call, we'd call important science. Now I'm question that. And, uh, but for my purpose of my definition, that's what I use the word important science to describe. Now, um, the, the flip side is that there is a lot, are there lots of observations, mostly observations, but sometimes even small studies that um, apply to only a very small group of people in the world and, uh, or just a, a minor uh, technique that perhaps a specific physician uses that he'd like to teach maybe another 10 or 20 physicians. And yes, that will never have the impact of a COVID vaccine and the New York Times will never want to write about it. But the point is that there are dozens and maybe even hundreds and maybe even thousands of patients that can benefit from these, I call humble observations, simple, uh, I call small science. And as far as I'm concerned, that sort of science deserves a, um, a vehicle for production and distribution. Absolutely. And there's a beautiful passage towards the beginning of your blog post in which you detail that important science is like an eye of the beholder standard where credible science is just based on like a desire to make an observation or do some research. So in the context of Curious and Curious's mission, what does credible science mean to you? Well, I mean, we're about credible science. I mean, we, I find this and I am a pretty noted academic, you know, in a, at a very you know, acclaimed university, and there is a lot of BS that goes on trying to make observations and studies appear much more important than they really are, and uh, oftentimes the entire science is discredited. I mean, one of the the sad realities is that these important science makes careers. It makes it results in professorships and tenure and and grants and so people love important science and also in the process they will they will cheat and they will do, they'll do underhanded little things to write important science uh, because it's so important for their career and sadly a lot of this quote unquote important science then proves out to be discredited 
So there's a, a very famous uh, article published by a, another Stanford professor named John Ioannidis about 15 years ago that, that showed that not some, but most, I repeat, most of the best science we publish, you know, randomized controlled clinical trials, most ended up being proven wrong or discredited. Not some, most. And so, so all this important science, yeah, I'm not, and I'm not arguing it shouldn't, doesn't have an important role in our society and shouldn't be published widely, but we obsess over it too much when in the reality is that an article in, in Curious may not have the impact for millions or tens of millions or billions of people, but it could in fact have a material impact on the lives of dozens or hundreds or thousands of people. And I, in some ways, I trust the, the science in, in Curious more because it, it's not trying to overstate its importance. That's very well said. And this actually takes me back to another curious conversation that we did a while back with Dr. Philip Cohen, who was reporting on um, tumor lysis syndrome, actually. And so that's the kind of credible science that Curious publishes, and we love to see it. So in this case, as an eminent researcher and author, what changes do you think need to be made to the current paradigms surrounding science so that we can start to value credible science more? Well, I think this whole idea of important science is kind of specious, and uh, I wish that we would, you know, no longer attach what I sense is largely artificial value to some science as being all important or not. Now, there's clearly, when you invent CRISPR technology, it's pretty clear that you hit it out of the park and you deserve all the acclaim that you get. But the vast majority of what gets published, you know, each and every week in the England Journal of Medicine and in JAMA. Is, is not nearly as substantive, not nearly as, you know, groundbreaking. And, and oftentimes what that science has is, is it has, you know, great famous authors or authors from big name institutions. It has impeccable methodology. It has impeccable statistics. It's very well written, but all too often it doesn't say anything. So it has all the superficial stuff right but none of what's none of the real important stuff, the ideas at the heart of the article is inconsequential. So I, you know, I've, I've lived in this world of academia for my entire career and I'm shocked by how people think it is self-evident that an article is important because it's published in Nature New England Journal of Medicine when all too often it's discredited. So uh, I, let's get back to truth itself. And then I'd like, what we try to do at Curious is just <clears throat> make it easier to report, to describe truth, truths, scientific truths, and, and then publicize them than any other journal. And then we'll let, we'll let people in the future figure out what's important or not, because sometimes it does take a generation to figure out that some article was truly much more important than we initially realized. Yeah, and this actually brings me to the second piece we're going to discuss today, the article that you published on neurological radiosurgery in COVID-19, because one can obviously see that that was an important topic during the time of the COVID pandemic, but it's also like holding very strongly to the principles of credible science. So that in that article, you detailed how neurological radiosurgery could alleviate some of the stressors around social distancing and surgeries performed during the pandemic. So Dr. Adler, what led you to publish this article? Um, well, it was very much an effort to give a shout out to my field and explain in part why it's so, so unique. Um, and in part, it was to lay concerns and to uh, about radio surgery as a, as a procedure during the pandemic. Um, you know, there are undoubtedly patients who were not getting treated just because people panicked about COVID. And, uh, and you know, the I, one of those people believe that we as a society totally, we both underreacted and grossly overreacted around COVID and, uh, and we're still haven't come to terms with that. But like radio surgery, there was no reason to delay tumor treatments for painful patients with radio surgery. Now with open surgery, it's much more challenging. You know, your, your patients are intubated and they're being ventilated and there's kind of spewing, you know, kind of, you know, lung secretions all over the room. And it's, it's, it's a much more complex process. And that's no way to discredit open surgery because I, I think open surgery is, is a modern miracle too. But, uh, but radio surgery has the unique attribute that it is so 
it's so sim simple and especially so hygienic that it one didn't need to be worried about COVID, particularly worried about COVID in the time of uh, when doing radio surgery. And then, of course, as I already mentioned, and I'll say it again, I want to give a shout out to radio surgery, a field that I think is unfortunately still not more widely recognized in the world today. Most people don't, you know, most doctors <laughs> don't even understand radio surgery. And even as many specialists have never seen radio surgery equipment. And of course, the public, it's, it's, it's almost non-existent. I mean, they know a lot about Da Vinci robots, perhaps. And now, the, you know, the New York Times will write about CAR T cells and, you know, and everyone knows about CRISPR and, you know, kind of, and then not that aren't though, those are all laudable things, but radio surgery is, is delivering the life-saving outcomes that any of those are doing, maybe by a factor of 10. And I just wish the field got more credit. Yeah, so let's go ahead and shine a spotlight on radio surgery. So could you tell us from a more technical angle, what is radio surgery and how is it performed? So I, I like to describe radio surgery via an analogy. And, um, and I point out that the sun by itself is not that potent a force. I mean, someone who is fair complexed like me, you spend a few hours out and I can, yeah, I'll get pretty badly sunburned. But if you put other than that, it's not that strong a force. But if you put a magnifying glass in front of the sunlight and you focus all those little beamlets of energy onto a point in space, you have a very transformative force. And, uh, and that's what radio surgery seeks to do, not with sunlight or, or visible light, but uh, ionizing radiation. So these devices, in which I've been involved in for much of my career, um, are, are designed to deliver radiation at a target inside the body, but I'm particularly interested in the brain myself, from many, many different directions. And by all those beams of energy converging at a common point, you get a cumulative effect and you get very little effect from each any individual beam. So one individual beam may have one one thousandth of the energy that a convergence of a thousand beams gets at a point in space. So it's not only is it as potent force, but it is it achieves surgical like outcomes. It really is not just some of the time, but almost all the time effective in destroying a tumor if a tumor is in fact the uh, treatment of the objective of a given tr uh, treatment. Uh, but it can also be used to treat things like vascular malformations of the brain. And the new field that I'm particularly interested in is it's used to, to change um, the, act, the activity of neuronal circuits. So um, you're an aspiring neurologist. Well, we're starting to understand that, that many diseases, especially the behavioral diseases, but you know, Parkinson's is another example, are, are not diseases of the brain, they're diseases of a brain circuit. And uh, you know, there's a little wiring diagram between all these uh, different diseases. And we're still understanding these diseases at a deeper and deeper level, but already we understand them well enough that we can alter the activity of these circuits with implanted wires into the brain, what we call deep brain stimulation. And this is increasingly becoming the avenue of attack for some of the most pernicious diseases in the world today. And I mean, things like uh, you know, addiction, things like, you know, you know, intractable depression. And so um, that's kind of a, a big idea. In fact, we think we can do the same thing in the brain without having to do anything invasive. So it's all non-invasive, outpatient and painless. So now I want to pivot to some more personal questions. You're obviously a person who has had a wonderful career so far and who's been an incredible author, innovator, and research. So what skills would you say are essential for a career in research? Do you have any advice for budding physicians or researchers? Yes, I would. I mean, um, and the first is going to be um, kind of uh, the antithesis of what you expect to hear. And... Uh, and its first is don't, don't tire yourself out too soon. I mean, it's great research isn't done in a couple of years. I mean, unless you're, you know, Dutton and you invent CRISPR. I mean, there's very few people for whom they have just an absolute brilliant idea that transforms the world. For most people, it is a dogged determination to keep digging and digging and digging at a topic and try and find a way to make what we have today better and better and better. And so it takes, you know, I, I urge people to think not in, in months, but decades of, and it's hard to speak to 
a young woman like you and say, you got to think decades. But if you're going to be impactful in life, and even many Nobel Prizes, you know, not that that's an objective in life, but even many Nobel Prizes were given to people not because of a single brilliant inspiration, but a lifetime of dogged determination in a specific field. So I find some people, young people that are around us, they rush so hard into something and then, you know, at first it's fun and then it gets tough and then it gets tougher and then it gets really, really tough. And then finally they just give up because they haven't planned for you know, decades of hard work. But if you are willing to upfront understand that that's what's involved, then you can have it successful. And then of course you need to be curious. You can't, that's hence the name. If you're not a curious person, you're, you're just not going to ever make it in science. Now, you've got to, enjoy, you know, testing a hypothesis, challenging conventional wisdom. Um, you got to be fearless. You got to really a great researcher wants to know truth at all cost, at all cost. And, and that's one of the problems with important science. Some of these people, they really don't care about the truth. They really just want to get an article in a very important journal. And, and, you know, and I believe it's not, and I'm not implying that anyone is cheating or lying, but you know, oftentimes they, I believe that many authors aren't even convinced that the story is in tr in totally true, but if they can get New England Journal of Medicine or, or Lancet or something, they go ahead and may publish. <laughs> so, um, so, but that's never going to be important science. If that's your, if your benchmark is to, um, here I'm using the word important, but, but enduring science. Um, uh, so if, if your entire objective is just to get the article published in a fancy journal, um, I mean, what's his, um, so Barry um, Sheckman, Barry Sheckman, he's a Nobel Prize winner from about a dozen years ago. He likes to refer to these journals as the luxury journals. You know, he's up at, at Berkeley and he, you know, he makes fun of them because he realizes that it's, it's not the journal that makes an article, it's the article that makes the journal. It's the article that makes the journal. And uh, that's something I've tried to incorporate into the curious way. So I said endurance and curiosity. What was your favorite paper that you've written so far? Um, well, I have to say it's my, uh, an article I wrote years ago describing my first big radio surgical machine and, uh, you know, it became, ended up widely, initially it wasn't really read or used at all, but today it's, it's, you know, after we look back 20 years ago, it's been heavily, heavily read and it's in a pretty obscure little journal, <laughs> functional stereotactic, uh, surgery. And so, uh, that's why. You know, my, that article has been published and cited many, many, many times, orders of magnitude more than many articles in in, in Nature or or, uh, or or New England Journal of Medicine because it took a while for people to appreciate it, but it was important. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure to talk to you today, Dr. Adler. Um, you're such an eminent person, and it was just awesome to hear about your developments in radiosurgery, as well as your blog post and your article. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Shreya. Thank you very much.